Seven men and all his ducks in a row. Xi Jinping's third term rubber stamped, a new Communist Party leadership unveiled, and a Congress that's to shape China's politics perhaps for more than just the next five years. We'll ask about those promoted, like Li Qiang, the man in charge of Shanghai's harsh COVID lockdown uh, measures. He, uh, the biggest asset he has is loyalty. We'll talk about that. Out with the likes of Xi's predecessor, Hu Jintao. We'll ask why he was humiliatingly ushered out for all to see. More broadly, if the inner circle of Chinese power is only made up of yes men, does that make its president stronger or weaker when he faces the unexpected challenges that come with the job. And how the West handles an emboldened she is also crucial. Germany's chancellor raised eyebrows with his decision for a solo run to Beijing at the start of next month. At the other end of the spectrum, is the United States correct in restricting trade on semiconductors and other vital technology? As Europe faces a winter without Russian gas, must it now contemplate a future without Chinese imports. Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're taking a look uh, at the uh, situation I in China and asking uh, whether it's loyalty first with this new leadership. Uh, from Washington, we welcome Zhongguan Liu, fellow for international political economy at the Council on Foreign Relations. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Economist Jean-Paul Cheng is, is with us as well. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, welcome back as well to Jean-François Dimeglio, president of the Asia Center Think Hello. Tank. How are you? And uh, André Lezikog Petri, president of the Joint European uh, Disruptive Initiative. Hello, François. How are things? The uh, France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24Debate. What did happen with Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping's 79-year-old predecessor, uh, shown the door on Saturday by ushers uh, just moments after the international press were laid into the great hall uh, of the people. Uh, first, he was reluctant to get up. Uh, then he finally did. On his way out, he slips a word both to the president and uh, to his prime minister, uh, Li Keqiang. Uh, what, I'll begin with you, uh, Zhong Yang. What, what, what did you make of it? Because uh, officially, uh, what we have is that it was not uh, anything out of the ordinary, according to the Xinhua News Agency. Right. Uh, so I was very curious about what was going on. So I searched uh, when that happened. So I searched uh, the Chinese news uh, and as well as website. And uh, exactly as you said, the Xinhua News said this is due to a health condition and uh, he was taken to a different chamber and uh, later they confirmed that that he was okay. Um, but if we watch closely the uh, video image, it does confirm that uh, Hu Jintao was reluct reluctantly uh, escorted out. And uh, uh, it uh, does not look like this is pre-approved sign. And it does not look like Hu Jintao was aware of what was going on. So, uh, it could it for one thing is for sure right this is the political theater and it definitely shows that xi jinping is showing especially to international uh, reporters who are who were present uh, reporting the national people's congress at that time saying that this is a symbol uh, to show he consolidated the power and more importantly crushing a lot of the rumors saying that there he's uh, he has a lot of internal vulnerabilities well, let's hear a couple of reactions. Uh, first, uh, from an ordinary citizen in Shanghai. I don't know about this. Indeed, this thing may be because he is of a certain age. Maybe he's sick or feels unwell. Maybe his assistant helped him to rest. This is normal. I don't think we should speculate too much about this. Okay, that's one view. Uh, then there's the view from abroad. Artist Ai Weiwei is one of China's most prominent dissidents. They called the president's private, uh, how do you say, guard to score him out. <laughs> Basically, it's to carry him out. So he was so frustrated. And, they, and the, the most funny thing is all the people sitting there, they dare even to, to see what's happening. They all faced like nothing <laughs> happened. It, it's very much like a fake photo of the reality. Because nobody moves, uh, nobody blinks their eyes even, just he's forced out. 
Jean-Paul Chang, you agree with Zhongyan that this is all political theater, and this is for the, 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 the consumption of the international press? Um, I try to avoid any speculation about the, what happened, really, but uh, um, you cannot exclude its, uh, its uh, ordinary health problem of uh, Hu Jintao. You cannot exclude that. That reminds me uh, the, the problem with uh, what happened to, the, to Hu Yaobang, a former general secretary of the party. In April 89, during a central uh, committee's meeting, he, he, he got a beginning of a heart attack and he'd been moved out at that time and he died a few days later. What I mean is it should be very, uh, um, you, you should be under stress to, to attend this kind of meeting during uh, one week time or 10 days, I mean, anyway. So uh, I believe for somebody of uh, uh, Hu Yaobang's age, it's, 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 uh, Hu, Hu Jintao's age, it's not easy. Uh, of course, there's some kind of a symbolism as well because uh, uh, you know that uh, Xi Jinping and his team used to criticize the, the previous leadership of... Uh, uh, the previous leader who, by the way, had uh, uh, still a lot of uh, his faction in the, in the top rungs of power. Not anymore, but uh, okay, but uh, uh, not anymore after the, this Congress, but uh, it shows that uh, the criticism about uh, Hu, Hu Jintao and uh, Wen Jiabao's mandates uh, has been continuous. Uh, they call the 10 years of Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao the wasted 10 years, you know. And it seems, uh, I mean, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the eyes of uh, uh, Xi Jinping and his followers, everything started 10 years ago when Xi Jinping came to power. So something is symbolic in this uh, Sim scene. Symbolic or more than just symbolic, André Lezikuk Petri? Well, I, the, the one thing I learned from my several years in China is that there is never a coincidence and that speeches are not important. What is important is action, action talks. And the fact that this happens in this meticulously uh, choreographed uh, assembly just before the, the motion is passed that she is now central to the system, to the party, uh, is, is very interesting. The fact that you clearly see forcefully uh, Hu Jintao being removed. And actually, the one, one of the two that is removing him is actually the director of the central office, which is basically one of Xi Jinping's right, uh, right hands. So it's a top, top bureaucrat who is in the heart of the system. And, and the other symbolic, I think, is Hu Jintao was a symbol. Clearly, it was still an authoritarian system, but he was a symbol of a certain collective uh, uh, um, way of managing power. We always remember that some decisions were blocked when one of the seven members were not there. Here, the fact that he's removed and that only Xi Jinping uh, remains uh, is, is a symbol that we totally change an era and that's now we are in totalitarian China. There's no other uh, way to, to... Total totalitarian China. We'll get back to that concept. Uh, but first, Jean-François Di Meglio, is, is this a removal that well, symbolically happened uh, perhaps a long time ago. Uh, I don't buy a minute the explanation that the only reason he was removed was uh, for health reason. But uh, I do disagree, of course, with Jean-Paul, but what I love with what Jean-Paul said is the parallel that you draw with another who, who you're born. Because Jean-Paul, you remember what happened to who. Not only was he sick, but he died. And not only did he die, but what happened after he died? 1989. And how did the uprise start? Just because people were bringing flowers to Tiananmen in memory of Hu Yaobang. Is it right? Yeah, but nothing comparable. He's not dead yet, <laughs> and I wish him long life. <laughs> That's incomparable. And, and probably he's not at all the reformer that apparently Hu Yabang no, uh, was. Hu Yabang was not either, but he was a symbol and he was showing that there could be room. And as soon as you crush a move like the one which was promoted by the support to Hu Yabang, then you can see some heads rising. All right, and so you heard... Uh, uh, the description there by André of it being totalitarian, the Communist Party conclu uh, Congress concluding, as it does every five years, with a big reveal, the six members of the Supreme Body, the Standing Committee of the Political Bureau. Seven, seven. They are Comrade Li Qiang, 
Comrade Zhao Leji. Zhao Leji. Comrade Wang Hu Niu. So it's the chance for all scholars and ordinary citizens alike, uh, Zhang Wan Liu, uh, to scrutinize uh, the new lineup. What was your take? So if I can just uh, uh, get this started, I do believe that um, if we look at the lineup of the seven men, um, pinnacle of the Chinese political power, it does reveal that uh, Xi Jinping has been able to uh, consolidate the power at the highest level and then staff all the seats with his loyal uh, loyalist. And this, uh, my reading into this is that it probably signals a departure from the reform and opening up era kicked off by uh, Deng Xiaoping about uh, 42 years ago. And the so, uh, and it, it it looks like a departure. You're saying, and you said men. It is seven men, and that struck a lot of viewers on the hashtag F24 debate. Why no women? Absolutely, and uh, yes, China does have a, a principle about uh, um, equal equality between men and women, but uh, at uh, the power tinnacle is not there. And if you look at the composition of the um, the the uh, uh, the the standing com the, the the Politburo just in general or the Central Commission, uh, there are not that many women in there. And whenever there is women or minorities, they will put uh, a bracket towards the end after the name, indicating that this is not a man, not a Hanzu. Um, so it it does show the limitation or the lack of uh, diverse diversity at the tinnacle of the power. Why is that? Um, so I believe there are two reasons, uh, in just uh, very broadly. First is um, women, the participation of women in politics, especially from the, if, especially the promotion of female uh, leaders from provinces along the hierarchies to the top level, has been very very rare. So if you did not have a lot of women in the partici in participation, and uh, there was no pro uh, promotion associated with it. Obviously, at the top, you won't have that many women. And then, secondly, uh, speaking to the, this is probably speaks to the uh, the, the deep rooted culture uh, uh, of China. In, uh, yes, we you know despite how we de despite we can de debate about you know the ch whether China has ha has or uh, uh, or ha has or the same China has five thousand years of history, but what is but the deep rooted into this five thousand years is a male dominated culture, and uh, this is apparent in the business cycle, this uh, society, and uh, it uh, absolutely is present at uh, the political uh, sphere as well. All right, there's seven members of this new uh, uh, Politburo. Four of them are new faces. One name is the one that's coming up in conversation a lot uh, here in Europe. His name is Li Qiang, the regime's new number two. He now finds himself in line to succeed Li Keqiang, no relation, <laughs> as prime minister. Uh, Li, who rose through the ranks, he was chief of staff to Xi Jinping uh, when the president governed uh, Zhejiang province. It was Xi who promoted him to Shanghai Region Communist Party chief. Here are these images from 2017. You see him at the time with then governor of California, uh, Jerry Brown. Uh, Shanghai uh, is uh, uh, where he was promoted to. Shanghai, we're on his watch this very year. There were sometimes draconian COVID lockdown uh, measures that sparked blowback. The same Li Qiang will, by the way, be in charge of driving growth, even as his boss uh, puts security uh, first, uh, Li Qiang, his rise, what does that tell you, Jean-François uh, Dimegbio? Well, once again, he, he, he tells that uh, the new leadership doesn't care a minute about what, uh, you know, uh, down below the pyramid of the society, people would think. Because if you remember what happened in Shanghai during the lockdown, of course, you may, you may argue that the lockdown was necessary because, uh, you know, the vaccine is not efficient, the vaccine is not uh, uh, spread enough in the population, but the lockdown was drastic. And the lockdown in that city specifically was resented very strongly. So, what the, so the message is, uh, however bad the situation was managed, what you have to remember is that this guy is able to lock a city 
like Shanghai down and think about what Shanghai represents. And my friend André here knows what Shanghai represents because Shanghai is the city of business. You lock down the business. You lock down the foreigners. And we had testimonies from foreigners locked down in Shanghai and mm. not able to conduct business. What does it mean about business in a future China? I just wonder. But Li Qiang, again, his, his remit will change now. Uh, and we don't know what's going to happen with this uh, lockdown, whether it'll be eased now that the party... Well, Congress whether it's will... eased or not, I think the meaning is Li Qiang is number two. Is Li Pu Ke Tiang, if I may play on words. Pu Ke means he cannot. He's not Li Ke Tiang, he's Li Tiang. Uh, and um, basically, he will be in charge, not having been in charge of a high-ranking position apart from Shanghai, because usually the number two in the uh, organization chart has been also in charge of a poor province. And that's the usual path you follow before you, 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 you get to the, to the top. He has not. So the very reason probably that the protégé uh, of, uh, uh, of course, uh, Xi, Xi Jinping, Jinping. There's, no, there's a question about that, but also is a strong man. And if he's not a strong man, he is intended to be a strong man by the boss, whose, I would say, uh, party is, is strong. And, yeah, Li Qiang is supposed to, to is rumored to become the next prime minister. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing, like Jean, uh, Jean-François just said, is that normally a prime minister has been a vice prime minister before. So he had na- national exposure, which he didn't. And the second thing on, you know, zero COVID has been something which has, and this lock, very tough lockdown, has been uh, widely discussed, especially in the West. But I think now more and more it becomes obvious that actually what the regime has successfully managed to do is to transform China into a digital surveillance state. Because we need to really realize what's going on today. China and the Chinese, as well as the foreigners living there, are living with the obsession of the green, yellow, and red. Basically, what appears, the code you have on your mobile phone, which dictates what you can do, if you can come out, if you can go to work, if you can buy a ticket. And so this dream that even Orwell that did not uh, dream of in 1984 has now become reality. And so I'm also extremely worried about, um, about the future of, of, of China. Number one, the word reform, like your colleague said, has not only not been, is not represented now. Li Keqiang is gone. Liu He, who was really the architect of, of, uh, of economic growth for Xi Jinping during his first tenure, is not there anymore. He didn't make it to the standing committee anymore. And, and secondly, the word, Gaike uh, Kaifang, so opening up and refor- reforms and open art, has disappeared from the official thing. So we are really witnessing China where ideology has become much more important than anything else. And the question is, when will that end? And my expectation is it will not end well. It will not end well, you're saying. We'll get back to that point. Uh, it's very difficult from the outside. If you don't follow the money issue, you don't speak Mandarin like most of the present company here, or all of it, rather, uh, uh, to, to get at the subtleties. Xi Jinping's speech at the close of the party congress, replete with those trademark metaphors and similes. On the journey ahead, whether the wind and waves are high or turbulent, the people will always be our most solid support and our strongest backbone. We must always sail with the people in the same boat, be with the people's hearts and minds, think what the people think act what the people want and constantly turn the people's aspirations for a better life into a living reality. Now he's addressing a party congress when he says we must always sail with the people in the same boat. What does he mean? He's insisting uh, about uh, the link between uh, uh, the Communist Party and the people, Chinese people. Is this just standard fair talk no. for every party congress, no, or is there something significant s- in this? Something significant, because uh, he, uh, uh, the meaning of the congress is some, somehow is besides celebrating 
the leadership of Xi Jinping. Uh, actually, it's, it's celebrating some, uh, uh, celebrating the the unity of this party, the mission of this party for the first coming years. Actually, you can compare this Congress to the Congress of 1945, the seventh Congress of uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it, 1945, so yeah, before, so, yeah, before the, 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 the yeah, before taking power. Yeah, exactly. It, it was uh, on the eve of the, the the big civil war. They are going to take the power uh, throughout China. Uh, first, they established the leadership, absolute leadership of Mao Zedong, unified the thought, uh, excluding all the dissident ideas, pro Moscow, etc. And this time, it's just like you know, they fixed some task for the coming years, a two big task. Uh, from uh, 20, uh, 2020, uh, 2020 to 2035, the Chinese modernization, uh, the modernization of China with the Chinese characteristic, and then from 2035 to 2049, uh, to make China a, a superpower in the world. And for this, the, 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 the speech, the discourse is actually, we need the Communist Party to guide the people. So we are close to the people. Why we are leader? Because we are representing the interests of the people. That's our legacy. That's the 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 the, the meaning of this uh, uh, this speech you just heard. But the, the certain thing is, they they try to uh, to uh, make the point about what is necessary to achieve uh, the ta to achieve the task to reach the target, okay? A, a, a strong leadership, a unification around the leadership of uh, Xi Jinping, and uh, some terms that you, 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 uh, you can hear in, in, the, uh, in his speeches is about the, the, the so-called the, the fighting spirit. The fighting, fighting spirit, task. Yeah, all the, the word time. fighting. That's mm -hmm. very new. It's, and they amended the constitution of the Communist Party at the same time. And when you look at all the new terms inserted in the constitutions, uh, you have the idea about, uh, about the, the fighting spirit, uh, the, 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 the sense of danger, the consciousness of a threat and danger. That means, and they're insisting about the fact that the world has been changing for four, five years already, and Xi Jinping has been successful. Uh, face, um, uh, he faced, to, uh, faced this threat with, mm. uh, with, uh, with success. And so they're insisting about this sense of uh, the consciousness of danger, of uh, threat, and uh, the, spirit, uh, the, 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 the combat, uh, the, the fighting spirit. That's very important. And it's, it's just like a kind of a mobilization of the whole country uh, around the Communist Party and, he, and its uh, leadership to achieve the task the Congress fixed. That's it. That's the meaning of this Congress, and the political meaning. Uh, the, use, the use of the word fighting, uh, this uh, feeling of danger, uh, uh, is that a pretext or is it reality? I'm putting the question to you, Song Yuanzhou Li, because you, because um, we have in the past days uh, this semiconductor ban slapped by the United States uh, on China, and it's having an immediate impact. Apple announcing it's forced to cancel plans to use uh, Chinese memory chips for its iPhones. Uh, the uh, semiconductor sector being squeezed by the United States. Uh, why and is it the right thing to do? So yeah, thank you again for the question. I think I would echo our colleague's point with regard, especially with regard to the uh, the, the, the em emphasis on the fighting spirit. And here, uh, the fighting spirit really is um, expressed through the less reform-oriented uh, settlement policy bureau on the poly uh, on the standing committee. And what that means, that means the supremacy or the dominance of politics over market pure market mechanisms in the future of, of in the immediate future of China's the Chinese economy and that also means um, from that the the attractiveness or the appeal of China and the Chinese leaders in Washington DC or in Brussels will be diminished Therefore, um, we would anticipate the Joe Biden administration to expand stringent 
export controls to uh, not just uh, um, semiconductor industries, but also other industries that China considers as strategic. And the idea is to make it extremely difficult and costly for Xi Jinping and his cadres to develop indigenous innovation tech capacity and, in China. And, and let me ask you just, uh, Song Yang, is this uh, a question of ideals? You heard earlier in the conversation André uh, talking about how Ch uh, China's uh, made the surveillance state a reality thanks to technology, or is it just simply competition uh, between business rivals? I would say, the first and foremost, is competition among business rivals, but with a new added angle of geoeconomics, because the chips are not just uh, making profit, it's also related to national security. And we do um, we do observe that Xi Jinping, in his speech at the National People's uh, at, at the Party's Congress, tied closely national security with the indigenous <laughs> innovation capacity. And on top of that, this would this really uh, clashes with Washington, with the sentiment in Washington D.C. Because uh, right now the the unspoken consensus is that Washington D.C. is no longer happy with how with, with keeping the China, with, with keeping the Chinese two generations behind American capacity therefore going forward we'll probably see more and uh, stringent and broader export controls on China however I would put a footnote there though uh, I would say um, if, if in, in the grand scheme of US China trade relations I would still see that I would still emphasize that trading with China is still very crucial for the U.S. economy and the, the American people, right? If we look at the latest number, the latest number that I, I have was by 2019, and U.S. export of goods and services to China supported a, a close to a million U.S. jobs. So it makes it, it, it's very valuable for uh, for a demo democratic regime, right? And then on the other hand, if you look at how much of the trade or U.S. export to China are actually subject to licensing requirement by uh, the Department of Commerce, there was only one percent, like one percent of the 151 billion of U.S. export to China as of last year was subject to a lot of this uh, export but, control licensing. But if Therefore, we're going forward. I Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, uh, going forward, I would just say, you know, tensions US, in U.S.-China trade would still be there, but they would continue to be there. But uh, they are going to be uh, relatively focused on the highly sensitive, but uh, the relatively small areas. No, but it, maybe it's small in terms of uh, volume, but semiconductors basically hold the key to everything we do in our Absolutely. daily in our daily lives. Jean-François uh, <laughs> Di Meglio uh, this can work both ways, right? I've seen reports that in China right now, uh, they're encouraging farmers uh, to plant more soy and wheat and l yeah. less specialty crops because they don't want to be dependent on U.S. imports. Is yeah, this the, you were talking at the beginning of the show about? We were talking everything about how uh, things around the Chinese Communist Party Congress are stage managed. The semiconductor ban was that stage managed no, as it, it, a. Well. The, the, as a the, calling the, card sent to that Congress. Uh, 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 of course, remember, starting uh, starting 2017, uh, Trump was already talking about, uh, you know, restricting trade with China. But uh, what happened? Nothing. Uh, I think this is a, a big a big step forward. Uh, this is very stringent because it does not only, as it was very rightly said, uh, you know, uh, plain imports and exports. It 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 goes up to every component. And you know that um, in the U.S. industry and in the exports of any U.S. item, you do have norms which prevent counterparts to use ITAR, I-T-A-R, uh, products if uh, that means products which are not rubber stamped by the U.S. administration, if you are not allowed to use products which are not rubber stamped by the U.S. administration, then you are in extremely dire straits. It did happen to the European aerospace industry when the U European aerospace industry, not for military reasons, but just for civil equipments, had to export items from Europe if they were 
not ITAR free, there was no way that they would export okay, so to, to, to that's China. nothing new. So but it, it go, it but semiconductors, very, yeah, this seems it, like a it, big step yes, here. And I would I would like to draw a parallel because you are saying that it's uh, you may look at semi semiconductor at only a business issue and possibly it's a geostrategic issue. You know, back in uh, uh, 1985, uh, the rising power in Asia was Japan. And in 1985, the Plaza Accord, uh, Plaza Agreement, uh, just ordered Japan to revalue the Japanese yen very strongly. Was it only a monetary issue or was it, you know, a power struggle issue? Probably there was a risk at the time that Japan could become the top GDP in the world. They were on their way to that uh, because of exports, because of the ability uh, to grow. And that stopped Japan's rise. And when we speak about China being the number one economy in the world in 10, 15, 20 years, but Jean -François, um, that this might not happen. Semiconductors, they're essential to, yes. the semi, for, to that surveillance state that André is talking about. Yes, but you know, as, as you rightly said, it's not only the surveillance state. I mean, the surveillance state, you know, it always it always existed in China. Okay, this is a digital society now, so if you want to do surveillance, you use chips. But if you want to use your doorman to, 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 to watch you, you know, there are as many doormen as you want. And, you know, when I used to live in China 45 years ago, when I, was, I was watched and I could not do whatever I wanted, and there was no chips at the time. Mm. Still on the agenda, while the U.S. Uh, toughens its talk, is Germany's chancellor traveling to Beijing November 3rd and 4th. He'll be flanked by captains of industry. Olaf Scholz, the former mayor of Hamburg, telling reporters at last week's EU summit that buying a stake in the port of Hamburg is still on the cards for Chinese shipping giant Costco. It's not about selling the port, as in Zierbrücke or Piraeus. At most, it's about a share. It's about a share in one terminal, as is the case in some Western European ports. And it's really only about one of many terminals of a very large port. But so many questions remain to be clarified that there is no interim status to report at the moment. Now, not everyone's delighted inside of Schultz's ruling coalition. The vice chancellor and economy minister, Robert Habeck, is with the Greens. Overall, it is important to have learned that dependencies on countries that may then play their own interests into these dependencies and then want to blackmail us are no longer just an abstract phenomenon. But look at gas and Russia are a reality in this world. We should not repeat these mistakes. Entre les Piaci, we painfully last week got over it an EU summit where the resentment uh, is still lingering over the fact that Germany went all in on Russian gas. This trip, beginning of next month by Olaf Scholz, good idea? I think it's, it's totally outrageous. I mean, how can the chancellor of a democratic country, 10 days after a, a supreme leader has now been elected, because there's no other word to call that, give him some kind of a democratic blessing by going 24 hours, which is painful for him and the delegation, think just about the jet lag, just f for what? I mean, it's, it's incredible. Maybe we are experiencing first the fall of Europe and first and foremost the fall of what is the largest country. I mean, we had for 15 years a chancellor who was completely naive on Russia, and now we seem to have a chancellor who, again, just does not get it. And uh, unfortunately... And Nord Stream arrived in Germany in Angela Merkel's home constituency. Yes. Uh, Hamburg is the port of where Olaf Scholz was the mayor. I think there is... Is this, I, is this just about... Uh, no, I, I, I don't, I don't buy any, in, in U.S. No, politics. I don't buy any conspiracy theories about that. I just think it's it's sheer incompetence. I think people today, uh, especially in Europe, have difficulties to understand the geoeconomics which is at play, and probably it's a, it's a, it's a desperate attempt. Actually, you know, actually, Xi Jinping is helping us. 
he, with his wolf warriors, you know, the diplomats who are much more aggressive, with his stance on Hu Jintao, is making explicit what the Communist Party, and I think we should say more the Communist Party rather than China. China is a country we need to respect. The Communist Party is really the strategic rival of democracies, and this should be combated. And I think here, we think that the, 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 the Chancellor of Germany thinks that by pleasing the emperor, you will get some, some reward for that. But I think he's living in the world of the past. So uh, last week, Le Monde, the French broadsheet of record, Jean-François Dimeg, they reported that Emmanuel Macron wanted to go with uh, Olaf Scholz. Why? Well, to, to also well, to first, court yeah, business yeah, yeah, or, no. or to try to well, rein in the German well, chancellor? Uh, uh, on unfortunately, this I'm afraid the scenario is off. Uh, there was a good scenario, which was mimicking uh, the, the meeting mm. of Xi Jinping with European leaders uh, that was in 2019. That was a good image of Europe facing China on a united front, should we say. If uh, our president would have gone together with uh, the chancellor, I think that was mimicking this image. That was probably good. Uh, if our president goes to China, that would not be straight to China, which in a sense is a symbol. But of course, the big difference is that uh, we are all are dependent on China. We, we shouldn't conceal that. But there is a key issue for, for Germany, and this is no excuse to Germany. But uh, of course, car industry and exports to China are key uh, to growth in Germany. And we can see you know, the auto show just finished in Paris. And we can see the, how, uh, I would say, assertive the Chinese car industry has turned and how assertive it is in probably barring more and more uh, Western cars uh, from being imported into China. For Germany, uh, it's not uh, the, the, the end of exports to China, but it's a big chunk of exports to China. So I wouldn't link too much uh, Scholz's visit to car industry, but it's part of it. Our situation is very different. And just to be back to the fighting spirit uh, by, by, by Xi Jinping, I think fight is fight. It might be war, but it might not be war. It might just be preparing the Chinese population to be stronger because, as Xi Jinping said, the context will be more and more difficult. You will have to make sacrifices. And I think what Europe has to show, if we want to combat the Communist Party and not China, and you are absolutely right, that we are able to display resilience and to make sacrifices. I'm not sure Mr. Schultz is displaying the so same spirit of sacrifice. Jean-Paul Chang, it's, it's said that uh, in 2021, Vladimir Putin looked at uh, the U.S. and its allies retreating from Afghanistan and thought they did not show resilience, and that's one of the keys, perhaps, we don't know, the historians will tell us later, for his decision to invade Ukraine. Seen from China, does the West have resilience? Uh, seen from China, uh, you have to go back to the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. At that moment, the discover that uh, uh, the teachers, Western teachers, failed actually in the management of the finance and uh, the economy. So uh, they become uh, more uh, self-confident, uh, trying to look uh, look for some uh, uh, own way to develop, etc. So it's it's dates back to the the, the last uh, financial crisis. But about the short visit to China, uh, I believe that maybe we are over um, reacting to to ideology and to politics when we talk about business, because right now 40% of the German cars are sold in the Chinese market. It's huge. And if you look at the reaction of the businessmen in Germany, they invested from the beginning of the year billions of euros in China in research and development. Uh, not but but you heard Zhong Yan earlier saying how, just how much business the United States does with China, and that's 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 you have your midterm elections in your United States. I'm sorry, China has been a kind of you know uh, uh, bipartisan. Uh, uh, how you say the, 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 um, raising the stakes? Yeah, uh, raising the stake uh, theme uh, systematically. Nobody dare to say that uh, maybe what uh, the 
United States are doing in the semiconductor business is hurting also the U.S. business as well. So, you know, you, if you want to put ideology in trade and in foreign relations, I believe the world will be really, really unstable. Uh, so there's three concepts here, Zong Yan Liu, and you're going to sort them out for us. On the one hand, there's trade. On the other hand, there's ideology. And the third one is security. And maybe we can use the word resilience that was uh, that was coined there by by Jean Francois Di Meglio. So, seen from the United States, uh, the resilience when it comes to all of this, and how far you can sort of push uh, the analogies uh, between the relations with Russia over Ukraine, the relations with the uh, U.S. when it comes to Taiwan, and what happens next. We lost her. We seem we seem to have lost the audio uh, there with. Uh, uh, am I good? Yes. Yeah. Now we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you very much for the question. I learned a lot from um, from from our colleagues here, and I do agree with uh, the uh, the genesis of the, the the conversation that you you just distilled for us. So thank you. And uh, I would say uh, I do have have my reservations with regard to the analogy between uh, China, Taiwan versus Russia and Ukraine. And uh, I, I, before I go uh, I, I explain anything else, I just wanted to emphasize one aspect, which is why I do not, I, I do think uh, the, the current, the, the current deadline that uh, people in Washington proposed for Xi Jinping is, is not realistic, at least from my observation. And I have two reasons for that. The first is demographic. The second is the economy. So the demographic, demo, de demographic wise, the reason I do not think Xi Jinping can uh, can, will feel comfortable to make a move by 2027 is because if you look at the PLA people, though the more, more than 80% of the PLA combating forces now, they are the one child generation, meaning they are the when one man or one woman who can carry the family, family name down the line. So I think that is a huge societal problem. And then on top of that, China also China is also going to face its uh, uh, one time the, the first time uh, that uh, population decline this year, right? So that's one reason. And the second reason goes back to the economics. So the economics ties back to the trade, the investment, and uh, the ideology and the geoeconomics. It, right now, the important lesson, if I were Xi Jinping. The important lesson that I would have learned from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the severity and the cost of a military action against Taiwan. And unless Xi Jinping and his new gener his new generation of leaders or the seven men, unless they are able to prepare the Chinese economy for severe sanctions, uh, and more importantly, to make sanctioning on China more costly for the sanctioners, meaning the United States or to a, to, a, to, a, to, a, to a certain extent the European Union as well, making the sanctions more costly for the sanctioners, um, that would, when he reached that point, he would feel comfortable to make a move. Now, has he been able to uh, prepare the Chinese economy uh, under or mimicking a kind of the condition of a Western sanction. And I think this can be related to how the zero COVID policy has been implemented. And uh, the reason I do not think zero COVID policy is going to be lifted anytime soon is because this allows Xi Jinping and his uh, fellows to sim simulate a condition like sanctions or maintaining or controlling China's access economically, people to people, a, 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 a real, a real life uh, experiment. Uh, one, we're out of time, but very one last no, brief one, word. One, I think the word that we should have pronounced is this famous Thucydides trap. You know, this old concept that two powers are bound to come together. And when you think about what you mentioned about chips, the fact that U.S. is coercion. China today on so essential topics like, like chips is actually increasing the pressure and the China feels so it uh, feels compelled to react. A vicious like, circle. It's really a vicious circle where the Europeans really need to draw a strategy. Not being soft, which 
uh, Germany shows too much, but being very clear where do we want to be independent and how do we want to continue to engage. I don't see that strategy yet. André Lozicuk Pietri, I want to thank you. I want to thank Jean Paul Chang, uh, Jean Francois Di Meglo. I want to thank uh, Zong Wang Liu for being with us from Washington. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.